Hello and good evening. Hi everybody. I'm going to be doing the story of a remarkable woman, absolute, what we call in America, son of a gun. Although she's not a son, she's female. Her name is Bonnie Woods. Bonnie is one of a kind, one of a kind. She pulverized Scientology. She was in a battle with them for years, years, not months, years, six years more. And then she had them bow down and fall on their sword and apologize profusely to the absolute libelous, facetious, just ludicrous, dreamt up propaganda that they made 27,000 copies of and distributed to her neighborhood, to her old school friends, to every, they traced down anyone and everyone she ever even spoke to and gave them this leaflet that she was a religious terrorist. Anyway, it's very, very few people that have Scientology retract with humility and apologize and, and give a cash load of money to make Bonnie go away. How did she do it? This video is going to explain how Bonnie did it and what the basic elements are. I want this to be inspirational because Bonnie's story is a blueprint. It's a blueprint of how to win. This is Bonnie's story. Bonnie, come on in and join us. Hi, Karen. There you are. Hey, you Bonnie. Are. Hello. Bonnie is an American who comes, hails from Ohio, although you've lived in the, you're an expat. You've lived in England for how many years? 30 years? 40 years? Uh, almost 40. 40 years. Yeah. She's married to a Brit, gorgeous guy called Richard. So, Bonnie, you were Sea Org at one time, right? Yes, I was in the Sea Org for about a year. At Asho? Um, um, yes, at Asho. Um, before that, I was staff at the Org in St. Louis, Missouri. Ah. For, for about five years. And then oh. I, nannied, I nannied for a wealthy um, Scientologist for a year, and then I went to the Sea Org in California, and I had many positions there, but probably the longest was Director of Processing. I see. Uh, so you worked in the Sea Org at American Saint Hill Organization. Asho. Yes, yes, I was at Asho for the year that I was in the Sea Org. Just, just, just out of curiosity, um, who was the commanding officer at the time? Oh, now you're asking. Was it John? Um... It was a lady. Oh, it was a lady. Um, okay. But but there was a, a direct a senior person I had called Norm, but I can't remember his last name. Yeah. Okay. So you left the Sea Org. Yes. In 1984. Mm -hmm. 84. Yeah. And where were you staying when you left the Sea Org? Well, I became critically ill in the Sea Org, and obviously they don't have a lot of um, admiration for that. Um, I actually stayed with, fortunately I had friends in Los Angeles um, that I could stay with, and then I was actually in the process of getting their, well, trying to get their permission to leave the Sea Org. But um, my Richard, uh, you don't know him, but he's, uh, some of you won't know him. He's six foot two and about 250 pounds, and he, he's a force to be reckoned with. And he decided that that process of trying to leave 
was taking too much time. And they threatened me with an expulsion order, but Richard decided to have a word with the ethics officer without an <laughs> without an appointment. Richard doesn't really like appointments. Um, so he went into Asho and said to the receptionist, where is the ethics officer? And she said, he's in, he's in an office. She He said, where is it? She told him. He went through the door, which unfortunately was locked at the time. And he gave him, they had given me a copy of my suppressive person declare, but they hadn't published it, but they gave me a copy to kind of show me that it might be better to change my mind. But Richard threw it on the desk and asked the man if that was his rubbish. <laughs> and I said, I said, I think he means trash because the ethics officer had was confused about what that word meant. So then he said, she's coming with me and that'll be the end of this. Well, yeah. Um, Very short. What was the form. what was the main charge in the suppressive person declare? What was the beef that I wanted to leave? Oh, so because it's a it's a it's a suppressive act to want to depart. To want to leave the seal. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I get it. I get it. You're suppressive. You want to leave. Well, school. the only life threatening thing to is staying in the sea world, but they seem to think it's it's suppressive right. to leave. So then you and Richard migrated back to the United Kingdom. That's his home country, Richard. Uh, yes, he's born in Worthing, West Sussex, which is about an hour from London on the south coast. We live right on the sea. Right. And you started, you really didn't just go away quietly. Well, I was pretty quiet for about 10 years. Um, uh -huh. I, lived, I lived in a tiny little village where there was no knowledge of Scientology, which was quite beneficial. Um, but I became a Christian in 1991, and there was an organization that wanted someone to help talk to families who had loved ones in, in Scientology, and they didn't have anybody with any experience of it. So I found out about them, and they... They said to me, will you help families? So we, we started a helpline called Escape. And I did some women's magazine articles and various media and put our telephone number. And then people began to call us. And that's what drew Scientology's, Scientology's attention. Mm. So you, you were a little bit like Paulette Cooper. She oh, I knew. bet. Yeah. I think at the time, and I don't know if it's so true today, but maybe it might be, um, there was no actual number families could call. You know, they couldn't pick up a phone and talk to anybody about what what they were going through. So that was, we actually spoke to in the 26 years, well, we had to make a list of those families for court, but that's another story. Um, but in that time period, I would expect that we probably spoke to a couple of thousand families. Wow. Yeah. Wow. They were all distressed with Scientology and wanted to. They wanted, to have, their fam they wow. wanted to have their family members come out of Scientology, oh, if possible, wow. by educating them. Mm. Oh, you would have been seen with binoculars as a as an enemy. Now, <laughs> as you you did some very brave, incredible action where you distributed a leaflet disclosing the secret, secret holy grail of Scientology which is the evil emperor kidnapped, had people come in for income tax, hurled them into certain chambers with hydrogen and this and that, exported them to Earth and had them sit on volcanoes which exploded, blah, 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 blah. A real science fiction story. And you distributed the. What did you say that that when you get to the higher levels, 
this is what Scientology teaches? Is that what Absolutely. you said? Well, the leaflet is called What the Scientologists Don't Tell You. And it's a mini biography of Mr. Hubbard. <clears throat> and um, it, I had a dear friend who is an expert on the subject. And he constructed the leaflet for me because I used to like to follow recruiters around in Brighton. And if they stop someone to offer them a personality test, I would say, would you like one of these too? Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. Well, I was quite an effective person in, in bringing people into Scientology off the street. So I was trying to kind of balance that in my own self. So I thought, well, for every personality test person they try to recruit, I could give them this leaflet. Uh -huh. And of course, they took it right back in to Scientology. Scientology. Mm. But I think they were aware of it before then. But mm. it's hard to tell because mm. they mm. invested so much money in private mm. investigators. Bonnie, we, we had a delightful day together because we both we were did. invited yeah, to John yeah. Eric's wedding. Is that the dear friend that helped you write the absolutely, leaflet? Absolutely, absolutely. And I love John to bits, and I've known John yeah. since he was the first person I ever talked to about Scientology. Mm -hmm. So I really have to acknowledge that he is the person that actually made his documentation and helped me see yeah. um, see the light, so to speak. Um, yeah. And John and I did many interventions together. We oh. used to go and visit. Yeah. And John, John is the author of the book, A Piece of Blue Sky. Is there some, there's some additional sentence there, A Piece of Blue Sky. Yeah, I always know it as Blue Sky. Uh, yeah. Right. Well, um, John, John and I have done several videos, like 30 videos. Did you know that? Yeah. We've done, I we've did, done a I lot. I did see, see some of them. I thought they were, they were very good. To see yeah. the two of you together is a real, <laughs> is a real treat. Yeah. yeah. So, 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 John, we're giving kudos to you. Absolutely. Salut salutations, John Ata. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, why don't we get, uh, you know, I, I, apostate Alex is just a wealth of information and has even more. Alex, come jump in and join us, would you? There! Oh, hi, Alex. Hi, Alex. Hi. Hi. hi, hi. Alex, what do you think of the bravery of Bonnie 30, some 30 years ago, having the guts to distribute a leaflet with the content of the secret, secret OT3 in England? Yeah, Bonnie's story is... Um inspiring and brave um you know you've got to think about this was before i mean the internet was around wasn't it bonnie at the time but it wasn't there wasn't as readily available as it is today in terms of information about Scientology. yeah yeah so this was like a really good way of promoting and getting information out there about scientology and it took a immense amounts of bravery and it's something that has shaped the anti-scientology movement in the uk since you know i was looking at getting some flyers distributed around east grinstead fairly recently and a lot of what shaped the wording and what we were going to put on the flyers was based on on bonnie's case so it's mm. uh, incredibly brave and i'm mm. honored to be here so thank you well, the, the, the honor of the leaflet goes to John, of course. Um, at the time when the leaflet was being used, I was using it, in, and many Christians that I knew who were demonstrating outside the shop in East Grinstead, um, the churches of East Grinstead got together and decided they would do a silent demo for every hour that the shop was open. So there was always someone outside distributing that leaflet. We couldn't actually acknowledge John's brilliance at the time, but now that leaflet is protected. I have an undertaking from the court that says I can't be sued anywhere in the world for publishing what I own. So the leaflet. Now, remember that this has not gone international. East Grinstead is a sleepy little, I can't call it a suburb, it's one hour from London, but it's a it's a small community relative to the big cities 
on, you know, on earth. It's a small little community in the south of England. And the cult's reaction to this leaflet was unbelievable. They went ballistic. Ballistic! They traced down every connection Bonnie ever had from school to every job she ever they traced her down and examined her with micro microscopic binoculars and <laughs> and then put out language like Bonnie was Satan with horns she was the absolute demonic evil of the universe I'm paraphrasing they didn't use that language but it amounted to be careful of her she's dangerous I can tell you the exact wording of the leaflet they yeah. put they put it out in all of the houses in East Grinstead initially including my own um, it said that I had come to an East Grinstead and that I was an anti-religious hate campaigner who used my Christianity as a front to perpetrate hate crimes. It had a very unattractive picture of me that had been taken when I was under surveillance in London by a private detective who I actually asked to take the other side of my profile because I'm partial to one side, but he had taken kind of a blurred video image. So it had a picture of that on on the leaflet. But I'm always grateful for the leaflet because that was what promoted my young barrister to defend me in the high court. Yeah, we'll be coming to that. Okay, so yeah. I think you mentioned they made 27,000 copies of this leaflet of how you were using Christianity as a front to be a religious hate hater. Yes. 27,000 copies? Yes. Also, they did three editions of the Freedom newspaper, and I don't know what the actual distribution of that was. Probably. Oh, the Freedom. Freedom. Yeah. <laughs> freedom. Yeah. yeah. It was a weapon to go after those who were critical of the, of the cult. Yeah. I can't say church. I really can't say church. Cult. The cult. Now, here's the thing. Uh, they made 27,000 copies, and that propelled you to file a lawsuit, correct? Yes. Okay. <laughs> what did you, what was the lawsuit? Were you claiming libel? Yes. I, I had a, initially had a, a solicitor who approached a young barrister in London, and when she saw the leaflet, she said it was libelous. So she took up the fight. Now, Alex, the laws in England are more, I would say, easier to prove libel than in America. Is that correct? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I don't know. It's just different. Um, you have to prove that your reputation has been damaged and you have to usually prove that there is some sort of financial um, harm or something, as far as I understand it. Um, but what I think is interesting about Bonnie's case is the wording is almost identical to Scientology's attacks against me when I did the protest in <laughs> November last year. They used exactly the same. They said I'm a, a part of a, an anti-religious hate group online. I'm a bigot. They, it's mm -hmm. like they just have a textbook of insults yeah. that they just apply to all SPs. Um, yes. And I just think it's, it's incredible that Bonnie didn't just sit on it and say, oh, whatever, just ignore them. She was like, no, I'm going to stand up for my rights here and took them to court. That takes mm -hmm. a lot of courage. I think they prefer that inflammatory language of one being a hate campaigner because there are strict laws in England about harassing someone mm -hmm. um, for their uh, proposed religious beliefs. So hate campaigning is something that they like to use to persuade the police to protect them from such individuals.
But it yeah. just makes them look stupid because Bonnie, you are one of the kindest, like <laughs> most caring, nicest people I've ever met. And it's just the word hate, bigotry, you know, all of this harassment. It's just not your character whatsoever. Um, and it just makes them look stupid. <laughs> so Bonnie, you filed a lawsuit. Yes. And they retaliated. Mm. What did they do because they, you filed it, It's called suit. a counterclaim. So mm -hmm. they retaliated and sued me for libel for what was said in the leaflet. And then they also sued me because um, the leaflet mentioned Narcanon. So Narcanon sued me too. Um, so there was actually three counterclaims filed against my lawsuit. Um, and my... And the problem with that was when you are the victim of being sued for libel, and I say that because it took six years to defend it, um, you have to prove that every sentence of that publication is true, which involved Alan and Overy at the end. But initially, Richard and I defended ourselves as litigants in person in the high mm -hmm. court. Mm -hmm. I'm going to come to how you did. you bravely. Yeah. Well, what happened? If to summarize, is they intimidated the lawyer or solicitor representing you. She she got overwhelmed. They started their monkey business. They started with tricks, and she she sort of resigned. She didn't want to work with you anymore. Correct. After a lawyer, the, a lawyer cannot resign in the United Kingdom. That you have to allow them to leave. You have to give them permission. Yes. But she asked, "Can I bail out?" Yes, and that when that happens, you lose your barrister because you have to have a solicitor yes. as a liaison. Right, but you then decided. There's a lot of courage in you, Bonnie. <laughs> you decided you would represent yourself, although you didn't know fiddlesticks about British law, correct? I, uh, my understanding of British law was very, very minimal. Um, but I did spend a lot of time in the law library in the high court. And when you, when you, before you go to court in England, you have to do something that's called an interlocutory. You actually have to hash out all of the claims that you're making and defending so that the court doesn't waste time. So you spend a lot of time with masters. Uh, we attended 27 of those hearings with masters who understood that I was a litigant in person. At the time, Lord Justice Wolf was very keen to protect litigants in person. So the masters, and we had the senior master who was the Queen's Remembrancer. He was the head of the masters. So he was told by Lord Justice Wolf, if I didn't have representation, he had to act as my representative. So I actually, in a sense, had very good help getting past that point. But after 27 interlocutories, um, I think we were on our knees pretty much when Liberty stepped in. Yeah. Now wait a moment. Who at, who who was the who was the main judge in your litigation? We've had probably every time we won a hearing, they would take it to the appeals court, which is three of the judges. So we've probably had six or eight judges. Okay. Who was the judge who quoted Judge La Lady? That Lady. was. Um, that was Justice Baker. Oh, okay. Was he a high court judge? He he is a high court judge, yes. And when we went into that hearing, um, he, he, I was living in person. They had a, a very, very expensive barrister. I think his fees alone were a million. Um, and jo Lord Justice Baker came and sat down at the at the dais on the bench and looked over at me and said, uh, Mrs. Woods, I haven't had time to totally look at your claim. Let me see. Oh, what do I know about Scientology? Said, Scientology. Oh, oh <laughs> Scientology. Yeah. I want to I want to read yeah. some of what he said. I know where I've heard of Scientology. <laughs> so, uh, this is this is this is what he announced in court. 
It's my favorite judgment, Justice Lady. The crimes committed by these defendants, Scientology, is of a breadth and scope previously unheard of. No building, office, desk, file is safe from snooping or prying. No individual or organization is free from their despicable conspiratorial minds. The tools of Scientology's trade are miniature transmitters, locks, picks, secret codes, forged credentials, and any other device they've found necessary. Now, this is the big part. Scientology is both immoral and socially obnoxious. It is a corrupt, sinister, and dangerous group. Its main objective is money. Boy, were they, was he right on the nose. It is sinister because it indulges in infamous practices, both to its adherents and followers, who do not toe the line unquestionably, and those who criticize and oppose it. Justice Leighty ruling his ruling in the High Court in London, thanks to Bonnie. So you walk in court and Justice Leighty gives his opinion <laughs> on the cult. Oh um, my God, how did you feel? Um, I think probably when you're litigating in person, it's quite daunting, as you could imagine. However, um, at the time, Scientology had a senior libel barrister who had written a book on evidence and how to discover evidence. And I met him outside one of the master's offices, and he said, uh, Mrs. Woods, he said, you really should get a representation. I said, well, thank you, but, you know, I'm quite able to represent myself. And he said to Richard, I actually could get permission from the court for her, for you to speak on her behalf. And Richard said, you clearly don't know my wife. <laughs> and he said, um, I said, oh, I said, I've read your text on discovery of evidence. And he said, oh, he said, that's not a text that's easily understood. He said, that's not a student's text. I said, oh, I have to fast track. I can't be a student. And then I said, I really prefer Bray because I'm an English literature major. There's a Victorian text on libel, which I studied in the law library in the high court. So he represented us. He represented Scientology. And during that hearing, Justice Scott Baker said to him, I said, my learned colleague, that w let me backtrack a little bit. It's a little bit complicated. They wanted all the names and addresses of all the family members we'd ever spoken to. And that was 5,000 addresses because we didn't just talk on the phone. And they wanted their names and addresses. And my case was, was not in the public interest because that would put those families in danger. So they were trying to argue that they needed those addresses. And I quoted the fair game law and I said, you know, my learned colleague is very aware of the fair game. And he said, at the break, we had a break for lunch. He was very irate. Their barrister was a Shiite Muslim and he came to see me and he said, Bonnie, I'm very upset with you because it implies that I'm a Scientologist. I said, oh, I'm very sorry. I said, when I go back in after lunch, I'll explain it to Justice Scott Baker. So when I came in, I said, uh, Justice Baker, I must apologize for imputing the reputation of their barrister and implying that he is a Scientologist, that I'm sorry for doing that. And Justice Scott Baker laughed and he said, oh, we don't want to tar him with that brush, do we? <laughs> nice, nice. Now, now, Bonnie, uh, uh, or actually Alex, the uh, America has something called the ACLU, American Civil Liberties Union, and you have the equivalent, what's it called? The just, what do you call Liberty. it? Liberty. What's it called? The whole... It's just called Liberty. Yeah, it's oh, just that's called it. Liberty. One word, Liberty. Yeah. Isn't it called Liberty Council? 
Just oh, liberty. Just liberty. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and what does liberty do? A liberty. Alex? Yeah, go ahead, Alex. I was going to say, I think Bonnie knows this better than I do. I just know that it's a charity that supports and champions kind of human rights, freedom of speech and that sort of thing. And they yeah. stepped in to, to help Bonnie. Yeah, right. we we met a lot of demonstrators against Scientology, including 700 Anonymous, who were the most fun. Um, but what Liberty does is it takes on cases where a person's right to speech or to free speech is being um, destroyed by an organization. They actually wrote to us and said that they couldn't represent us because they weren't financially able to take on such an adversary. But fortunately, they have a panel of the 15 major London law firms who each year pick a case to work on pro bono that they think represents civil rights. And they chose my case. Whoa, whoa. So that's how you got Alan and Overy. Yes. Okay, let me take one moment to say Alan and Overy is arguably the first or second or third largest British law firm. Its revenue, according to Wikipedia, is two billion pounds annually. That's how much money they make. Two billion with a B. They often represent huge governments. If Saudi Arabia wanted, you know, a lawsuit on their oil or whatever, Allen and Overy is in 40 countries and has over 5,000 lawyers. So no longer was there a David and Goliath, little <laughs> Bonnie, the, and the Goliath of the Scientology cult with its war chest of extorted money to keep going. Allen and Overy was a peer or equal, two giants. There's an old saying, when the elephants fight, it's the ants that get trampled on. <laughs> and, <laughs> so two elephants, Allen and Overy and the cult of Scientology. This is the good, now we're starting to get into the good point in this video. Allen and Overy, did you say they spent $1 million defending you? We think we think in that region, um, because they worked pro bono um, for free. But I, at one point, I had the head of the legal team, and I had three solicitors and a team of paralegals working on it for two years. So, you know. Bonnie, can I just ask, who were representing Scientology at the time? Was it Carter Ruck and Peter Hodkin, or was that... Was this prior uh, to them taking over? Uh, Peter Hodkin is always instrumental in any litigation. He would always be the liaising a solicitor. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, I, Carter Ruck was not involved. At that point, they seemed to just hire... Ver they had a, a Queen's counsel called Nathan, who they preferred. They would tend to kind of farm out to whoever they thought might be the best adversary amongst the barristers and QCs. Sure. And just to give everyone a little bit of context on Peter Hodkin, he is still Scientology's lawyer to this day. And he's <laughs> very buddy-buddy with Dave Miscavige. He's received a Rolex watch from him. He gets his entire bridge servicing for free, mm. um, you know, as long as he keeps moving on it and representing the church. So mm. representing the church legally and defending themselves in the courts and uh, defending and their reputation is hugely, hugely important. And they will spend millions. Let's not forget this is literally about a little flyer that Bonnie was giving out. Right? <laughs> a little flyer. <laughs> well, I was, on, I was on a lot of television when Heber Gents came over. You'll like this. When Heber Gents came over, Scientology had done a, a commercial and... ITV, who is our like one of our channels, um, they had refused to put the commercial on air. And Heber Jones came over to kind of head the campaign to get the commercial on television, basically. So I was on, on breakfast television with Heber on the BBC and on ITV talking about um, why the advertisement was less than truthful. Um, yeah. 
So they knew that I did media. I did quite a few magazine articles and things like that. So because our telephone number was so publicly available, our kind they kind of knew how to find me, I suppose. I just want to say Heba Jench was my former husband, the father of my son that was killed because of Scientology's obnoxious, obnoxious, hateful disconnection policies. That's a whole other tributary we're not going to get into. But Heba, I still get emailed to this day, Karen, what happened to Heba? Any data on Heba? So let me just throw in very quickly a one little thing. Heber is in a rest home in Southern California. They don't want him dying off on int base. They're very, they don't want people dying on int base. Heber has had dementia, Alzheimer's dementia for some years now. And he's, he probably wouldn't recognize me if I walked into his nursing home. He's, he's, he, he's had some strokes and he can't even sit up straight. They had to film him for something and they had to prop him up so he didn't just flop. And the reason I want to say this is he had devoted his life and did years of Scientology technology, 50 years, 60 years in the cult. And what is the end of the road? He's shunted out of church property and he lives living on with dementia and alzheimer's and i departed from the church 13 years ago and i've never done better life is just i have more vitality than i ever had in the sea org i'm winning in every sector of my life because i escaped the cult of scientology and Heba, in his dementia, winding down, stayed with the cult. So compare Heba's life, my ex-husband, and mine. I am a product of what happens when you leave and depart the cult of Scientology. All right, back to Bonnie. This is Bonnie's story. So... Allen and Overy selected you. Bonnie, that's monumental. There were 15 cases they could have chosen. And it was serendipity. It was completely, I, what a blessing. The universe, the universe chose <laughs> somehow. I mean, Allen and Overy is a giant. It's an elephant. It's 5,800 lawyers, 40 countries well, of the world. And you, you were a chosen one. You have to remember that I serve the God who created the universe. <laughs> very, very say. much so. Very yes. much so. Yes. So you were the chosen one for Alan and Overy. When I went to meet Alan and Overy, I went into a large conference room with the whole team, and they apologized to me that they had never represented anyone in in the high court who had been in twenty seven hearings. And, and Tim House, who was the head of that group, he's the head of litigation, he said, and look, all of us need to do what you've done. <laughs> so he said, the next time you have an interlocutory, we'd like to come. So we went to an interlocutory, and I was outside, and Hodge Malek there, QC, came down the hall, and uh, he said, good morning. I said, good morning. We went into the master. At that point, it took five London taxis to get the team there. Tim House arranged that they would just walk into the hearing. And master attorney said, good morning. Can I help you? He said, yes, we're here to represent Mrs. Woods. Well, I thought Peter Harkin would have to, you know, have some serious respite care. Um, so that, I mean, they were always... Um, amused really they sent out a they sent a memo to everyone in their staff at the time the london office had 1500 staff and they sent a memo out when they took my case and they said anyone who wanted to work on it could volunteer and that was very popular because that looks very good on your cv to be working on a liberty case so we had a lot of people volunteer and all of their work they did in addition to whatever else they had to do. 
Bonnie, I no... can I just ask? Sorry, Karen, just very no, no, briefly. Um, Bonnie, can I just ask? Um, what was like? What was the look on the faces of Peter Hodkin and Scientology's lawyers when you walk in with Alan and Overy representing you? Because that it must have been a look of shock and horror, surely. Well, Peter Hodkin was never allowed in the master's interlocutory, um, but he saw them filing in. He used to wait in the hallway. The only people who can come in to see the senior master are, is the litigant in person and their counsel. But my master, Turner, had to send a clerk to get some more chairs because Tim House came himself with two other um, and my and my barrister. And I have to give Alexander Marzak so much credit. She was a junior barrister when she took on my case. And and that was very brave, I think. But she had lots of friends who were QCs. So um, they would come to the hearings and help her. I and, love it. You're mixing yeah. with the royalty of <laughs> law courts and you are absolutely with the aristocrats and blue bloods of those that kick ass and win cases. And you're mingling with all of them. My goodness, Bonnie, I I, I envy you. I want to just, can, can I just ask, is sure. Peter, was Peter Hudkin the husband of Margaret Hudkin? Son. Oh, this, oh the son, because Margaret, and I twinned, and I knew her really, really well at St. Hill, right through my days of doing the St. Hill Special Briefing Course, Margaret, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. So I knew the Hudkin family intimately. They were just, but but I wasn't, I couldn't, I, I didn't know, was there Peter Sr. and Peter Jr.? I don't know anything about Peter's father. Um, you only ever heard living in East Grinstead about Margaret and Greenfield and, and her involvement with education. So I don't have any information on that. Yeah, Margaret was the founder of Greenfields. I think yeah. she started the school. Yeah. But I yeah. think as far as Peter Hawkins is concerned, I I had a lot of time spent across from Peter Hawkins. Um, one of the things that happens in court is you have to allow the other side to see your evidence. So you have to, I didn't, a dear friend of ours said, Bonnie, there's no way they're coming to your home. So he hired a very beautiful place in East Grinstead at the, um, in the park, like a, a place you could rent. He hired a room so that I could bring my evidence and they had to come there and Peter came. And I had the OT3 materials in evidence at that point, and he had to sit and read them. And he actually went to sleep, but I think it was more than sleep. <laughs> I think he was. You got to do I a actually, I actually felt sorry for him because mm -hmm. I knew that he was doing something that, you know, he absolutely didn't want to have to do. Yeah. I, I find him a tragic figure, really. Who? Peter Hodkin? I do. Yeah. yeah. Well, if he if he was well, this he was second generation. Yeah. He, did, he 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 grew up believing he's saving the planet through law, and, and he, he wouldn't dare yeah. he wouldn't dare do anything else. Right. But but he, do you know if he was lower case level when he had to read all this? I think so. So after six years of back and forth. You and your lawyer team demanded, didn't request, you demanded that the OT levels be put into court records. Is that what happened, Bonnie? Well, that was a very significant hearing because um, in order to prove that my leaflet was true, obviously it contained OG3 information. So in order to prove that, it would have prejudiced their my case if I wasn't allowed to put in the materials that proved what I said was true. So my barrister went into the hearing asking that they be disclosed. And there was a great furor. I mean, there was jumping <laughs> up and down. There were people from America. I think it might have been Starkey, but I'm not sure. I don't know them well enough. But there were people come from America who were instructing the barristers instead of Peter. And there was a big, and they started jumping up and down, and every, and they asked for a, a, a break so they could go out in the hallway, and talk, and they came back in, and um, 
when the judge was going to, the judge was going to rule that they had to give it to me. So what one of the things they do is they read the ruling out before they do it, giving the other giving the other side a chance to quit if they want to because they know what's going to happen. So he read it out and they knew what was going to happen, so they quit. They just dropped everything. So my barrister said, well, that's all well and good. However, well, actually, the justice said Mrs. Woods had spent six years of her life defending what she says is true. So now you will have to sign an undertaking to say that she can publish whatever she likes. That is Bonnie, the evidence. Was that, sorry to interrupt, but just a quick yeah. question. So was that the judge recommending the undertaking or was it your barrister saying we want an undertaking the judge recommended wow. that she write an undertaking and alan and overy had an entire huge office that had to be very secure because people kept trying to get in to it um with all of my evidence so the judge said any evidence that mrs woods has in court could be subject to an undertaking that she can publish it now that you quit. And my barrister was just a little junior barrister at the time. And she's so amazing, very energetic. She ran down the hallway to Nathan, who was a, a QC, and said, you know, she, you want to quit. And they said, well, would she take 20,000 pounds in damages? And she said, just a minute, I'll ask. And then she came back and then she said, you, you, what do you want to say? I said, no. She skipped down the hall and she said to the QC, she said no. <laughs> so they dropped, dropped it. Yeah. They, they, they had to pay you hard cash. When, when the libel judgment, yes. I got to choose how much. I got right. But, but what was what was good is you didn't have to pay the lawyer. You didn't have to pay Alan and Overy anything. It was pro bono, pro bono. Yes. Even though they had spent a million dollars. Oh, probably more. Right. Yeah. yeah, probably more. But, you know, this is, this is, this is a story. It's just. I think, <laughs> Go I ahead, think Alex. Also, this is significant because the undertaking doesn't have an ex expiry date, does it? So. No. This ruling, how many years ago was this judgment? About 19... 1999? No, 99 they settled. Um, probably 97, 96. So we're talking over 25, almost 30 years. Yeah. Um, and obviously more, you know, of, of mm -hmm. you being protected. You can say whatever you want about Scientology and they can't yeah. sue you. That's why I like to keep my name on the leaflet. When I had some people protesting in, in Clearwater and they asked for the leaflet. And I said, well, it's really important. If you want to use my leaflet, I'm happy. But you have to keep my name on it and don't change the wording because mm -hmm. the leaflet's wording is protected. Mm -hmm. so, so let's see now. Let's 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 do an assessment of how <laughs> big a win you had. Number okay. one, they had to pay cash, cash, hard cash, yeah. as a means. Two, yeah. an apology was given that they were liars and had lied and libeled you. Did they apologize fully for that? Yeah, it was read out in court, and my barrister wrote the apology. Ah. And then it was read out to the press in front of the courts. But the important thing about the apology that maybe, I don't know if anyone else has one. If they do, I'd like to talk to them because it's a good thing to have. It's, I said to my Queen's counsel, he said, Bonnie, in libel, technically, you don't have to say sorry. You just have to pay money. And I said, well, I'm not settling until they say sorry. Because I feel that if you commit crimes... I have to be personally accountable. I said, I want them to say sorry. He said, okay. And then he called me back 50 minutes later and he said, okay, they'll, they'll let us tell them how to say sorry. Ah, so hard cash, apologies, falling on their sword. And, the, and now whose idea was it that they had to sign off 
that you could say whatever you want, whenever you want, in whatever medium. Um, you because think, and that they could never, ever, ever sue you again. Whose idea was yeah. that? That's my young barrister's idea. Alan and Overy, Alan and Overy barrister, and they had to sign off that you could never be sued, no matter what. More importantly, that I can publish anything that was contained in the evidence I gathered in six years in court. And that included the OT3 materials? Uh, yes. Yeah. Is there, is there anything else, Bonnie, that you had in evidence that you haven't published or did everything end up being published? Oh, I didn't publish everything um, that I have in evidence. I kept... Um, I kept the major important things, I suppose, that I put into evidence. But I mean, the OT levels are, are publicly available everywhere, which is such a joy. Um, so from that aspect, but I think probably Richard and I are a bit bewildered by the fact that we actually won a case and an apology of litigation based on fair game. And we offered to help we have uh, in the past offered to help people and they didn't seem to be too concerned to have that help. Not that we, we don't need it. I mean, it's quite a job you can imagine, but yeah. yeah. No, no. You mean you offer to help people in litigation, not yeah. offer to help people to escape. Got to be careful how you word it. Oh, you I, offer... I help people to escape every day. Um, that's, that's my bread and butter. I, I ah, would do anything to help okay. that. But I also offered help. I, I think on, I offered on help litigation. To, mm -hmm. Yeah, to Mr. Rinder's wife. Not Mr. Rinder, sorry. Um, who's the other one that... Um, Marty Rutherford? Yeah, to his wife, because she was trying to fight a fair game action, and he, he didn't want to know. So I think that the fact that we won a fair game action, you know, if it can be helpful to people, that would make the six years, you know, worth more. But I mean, obviously, we're not we're not concerned whether they do or not. But it is something that might be helpful to someone who's trying to fight fair game. I know that fighting in America is very different than fighting in the United Kingdom. Mm. Well, but I think your story demonstrates to people who do end up in litigation wherever you are in the world that if you stand up against Scientology and you put your foot down and you stand your ground they will eventually back down. And even if you are you can't help litigation in the US as a different jurisdiction or whatever, regardless, your story should serve as inspiration for the bravery that you have displayed. Well, I would hope, I would hope so, because my heart is for people to escape. Good, good job, Bonnie. I just want to say that there was a sort of echo copy story of yours with Karen Spank of the Netherlands. Do you know about oh, that yes, story? Oh, yes, I remember that. I because remember Karen that. Karen did some little article in a throwaway newspaper. Who reads Netherlands? Some dying thing. And the cult went, they made this into a worldwide story and they brought out their big guns on Karen Spank. And then she insisted on putting the OT levels in the court records and immediately there was this incredible withdrawal and sound of silence so the big the takeaway lesson here is they have secrets they yes, have absolutely. things they embarrassed that the world that's why it's all confidential got to get rtc clearance to learn about bts and clusters you have to get ethics clearance to find out how trustworthy you are to not go blabbing on the internet that your body is a mass of extra things that you have to jettison and expel and only Scientology, no other religion in the world has the technology to jettison out your attached spirits. That's that's, you know, that's the holy grail that Scientology want to cover up, cover up, keep, keep buried till you get clearance 
until your one million dollars into donations then they will disclose to you the Zeno story correct <laughs> what she <you> said <laughs> so Bonnie as Alex says your story was inspirational you are inspirational you you just you stand your ground I think it's because I think it's because I'm an Ohio farm girl but you know you can take the girl out of Ohio but um, I I think initially when they first started the campaign of harassment I think it just made me more determined at first I was puzzled you know why do you want to bother this housewife who you know what damage could I possibly do um, but the ferocity and you know the ferocity of the harassment wasn't just Eugene Ingram's investigating it was huge on my family and when they came after the harassing my children that's I think I got really into kind of a mother bear type routine. Ah. so I said no wait a minute you know you can say what you like about me I'm here I'm on the street you can see me but don't go to my house when I'm not home and harass my children in their own home and my neighbors have to step up to protect them that kind of motivated me the fact that the absolute ferociousness the worse it got the more determined I got mm -hmm. Bonnie you are magnificent oh, you, you are too kind yeah Alex I want to thank you so much for your willingness and all the work you do Absolutely. Alex is uh, Alex is a dear dear close friend of mine and Alex is the new generation of warriors. Yes, he's yeah, he's yes. my hero. He's my no, young, Bonnie. Young I'm following. I'm following in your on, in your footsteps. I've uh, I've got big shoes to fill. Ah, uh, no, I think it's wonderful that you do what you do, and to the extent that you do it, and you definitely, it's such a good thing that you have the skills, because it is going to be social media that will get them. Yeah. You know, a very wise man called Vaughn Young, who is long since dead, he gave a wonderful statement in brief short sentence. He said, the internet is Scientology's Vietnam. Mm. It's a war that cannot be won. Absolutely. That impinges a lot in American hearts because you couldn't win Vietnam. It was just a bloodbath. Mm. And the internet and social media is Scientology's Vietnam. It's a war that cannot be won. Bonnie, I love you dearly. Big hug. Oh, I love you is, is your husband, is your husband there? No, he's, is he around? he's, he's not well at the moment. But... Oh, okay. I was going to have him just come yeah. behind you and wave to the yeah. audience. So yeah. They see this handsome dude, which yeah. is what you would call in America. What <laughs> yeah. My husband is my husband is what we would say in Ohio, a very tall drink of water. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Bonnie. Thanks Thank a lot. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Alex.